Th thank you, uh, Sheila Page, ODI. I mean, obviously, given that my first boss was Sanjay Lal and my first work for ODI was on changes in composition of manufactured exports, I'm delighted to see this book. But I, I have some difficulty in seeing what I can take away that's new from it beyond some excellent up-to-date data, and I'm grateful also to Maggie for updating her charts. Uh, in particular, uh, you go from the description to the drivers to the policy, but it was not clear to me what the uh, market failures were specifically that the policies were intended to, to deal with. I mean, one can see that good industrial policy producing good results is a good idea, but I didn't quite see what was being targeted that was a failure that policy could meet. I mean, it was a little bit of a, of a jump from one section to the next. And I, I've never had much sympathy with the term drivers in this sort of analysis. I mean, what's important is the response to stimuli. And I would have liked more focus on the way in which different countries have responded to the various external forces, not drivers, which you identify, rather than on the drivers themselves. I mean, what <coughs> is it that makes some countries, some <coughs> companies, some employees, some training establishments respond in particular ways and not in others, and maybe then what can policy do to, to change that? But I didn't see that sort of line of reasoning happening. And very specifically on the policy side, I was astounded that you were more sympathetic to bilateral agreements than to world agreements. When bilateral agreements are the best way for a strong country to impose itself <coughs> on a, a weak country, and yet you prefer uh, bits to the WTO. And I, I just couldn't understand that at all, uh, I'm afraid. All right, thank you. Three important points. Uh, Jumbo? Thank you very much for the presentations, all very interesting indeed. Uh, my name is Jumbo Holman, research officer at ODI. Just a couple questions. First of all is that uh, the, role of the, the role of the state uh, seems to be n neglected in all these uh, presentations and certainly in our discussion. And we know that uh, manufacturing industries have made several attempts in Africa to try to take off, uh, including attempts by the Soviet Union in the 70s, 80s, and including some recent attempts now um, by other international development partners. Um, and, and, and those attempts have failed dramatically uh, to a large extent. So, and, uh, so my question is, what are the conditions for a state to be pro-growth or the pro-industrial policy knowing that those, uh, those, those, those policy would be conducive for productivity growth in the long run. And uh, the other one is, uh, is, is you know, I'd like to say, slightly on, on China, on manufacturing. Um, uh, I, I recently returned from a trip in China two weeks ago. And if you have been there two weeks ago and, and experiencing the smog <laughs> in major cities, I'm just wondering how far um, our manufacturing base is going to stay in the country. Um, knowing the planetary uh, limit, and so on. And also the other development, sort of um, conducive for deindustrialization, possibly in China in the future, is the, is the arrival of cheap energy sources, such as shale gas, in the United States, which probably would have some onshoring effects uh, for industries in, um, in, in North America. Uh, so those are two points I'd like to make. Thank you. All right, thank you. Gentleman here. Hi, my name is Justin. I'm a PhD candidate and, uh, at the University of Cambridge, and I'm working on how Sub-Saharan Africa can build up a, a manufacturing base. So this has been very, very interesting for me. Um, I want to touch upon what kind of industries least developed countries uh, uh, benefit from specializing in. And here, um, especially the type of manufacturing industries that have been mentioned have been agro-processing, uh, beverages, uh, textiles, garments, and so on. Um, looking at some of the successful um, industrializing developing countries after World War II, such as uh, Japan or uh, South Korea, they started uh, early on when they had income levels that were very, very, very much lower than the, the rich countries at the time, specializing in, in industries that they necessarily didn't have the endowment structure to specialize in. Like, uh, I think Japan started um, 
looking to its automobile industry in the 1960s and protected it for nearly four decades before it uh, was competitive. And South Korea looked in the 1970s to its uh, steel industry. Uh, and these kind of industries were termed uh, by many observers as, as the wrong industries at the time. So would it be possible for the, the least developed countries to pick some type of high-tech industries that haven't been mentioned, sort of emulating to some extent uh, what some of the successful uh, developing countries did uh, in East Asia? Are you working with Hajun? <laughs> That's right. Why did I? <laughs> okay, um, the, the lady over there. Hi, uh, my name is Stefania Beniz, and I was I was interesting in I was interested in the uh, presence of informal manufacturing, and I was just, I was just wondering whether it was um, whether you had experienced difficulties in sort of measuring uh, the size of the informal of informal manufacturing and whether and whether it's sort of hard to to keep to keep an eye on its development that's that mm -hmm. was it all right um so i think we need to go back to uh, to uh, to luda di at this stage there were quite a, r a lot of uh, comments that you already had mm -hmm. um i suppose in the, in the la latest round comments there is something about sort of the role of the state and and uh, in terms of addressing market failures, what is the market failure? Have they changed over time? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, sort of thinking through, sh sh should uh, uh, countries pick the wrong industries, uh, a la Hayung Chang, or is it should they pick the the, 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 the right industries based on comparative advantages, a la Justin Justin Lin? Um, uh, what is your what is your uh, your view on this? And it's it's related to your chart, basically uh, the chart that you showed about the contribution of different manufacturing sectors. Uh, is that inevitable? Is that uh, the way the, the path inevitable, or uh, is pol does pol do policies and institutions play a role there? Should I speed it up? Do they need to? Uh, is are these paths optimal for the for, for for them in terms of employment generation, or what wh what is the role in uh, in terms of policy in terms of helping helping countries along to 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 generate jobs and and, and, and create growth, and a number of other other questions. So maybe it's it's time for you to uh, to have some uh, some answers to this and then see how far we get, and then maybe there's some other uh, questions we can we can get in and, and response from the panelists as well. Three caveats first. The first one is that. Uh, we are limited by a number of pages and a number of <laughs> and we couldn't address uh, all, all the issues which we certainly thought about. And the, none of the issues you raised were not thought about. It was just that we couldn't. Which doesn't mean that I'm not going to say about so something about them. But <laughs> uh, the second point is that we have a mandate which is linked to manufacturing, and that also limits the scope of the things, the kinds of things that we can we, we, we can do. Um, ju just just so, so the. Um, you're aware of the constraints on which we, on which we, we operate. Um, now let me just start addressing some of the questions that um, that uh, um, the, the, that has been, have been raised. Is uh, the, the relationship between manufacturing and services the most interesting one? Okay, and 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 when actually we we do have figures of both the productivity in, in the relative productivity in manufacturing. We also have figures about pr productivity in agriculture. We haven't explored as much as you have asked us, but we did try to put some figures of what is going on in, in terms of relative sectors. Uh, funny enough, at the beginning of the development process, the productivity in in in, in, in service, although they, they, they declining, it's it's relative higher higher than than an average too. People seem to be moving from, from when they move from rural areas, they move to, to jobs in the government, in etc. That, that generate a lot of uh, value added, funnily enough, <laughs> as compared to agriculture and productivity that grows. So there are interesting phenomena here that one has, one has to explore that we thought about, but we just could not have, did not have enough time to, 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 to go deep into. The only, the, the only issue that we wanted to explore in some depth here was this this connection be, be, we, which was it, it was evident we all knew about it but we tried to document it was uh, how many jobs are directly related by manufacturing that that we needed to know because um uh, which will help us to address the employment problem in developed countries which which was crucial one of the characteristics of this report is we try to address look into although look into trends in all countries even though the policy recommendations focus on developing countries because that's our mandate. Can I just ask a question? What is directly related to, to um, manufacturing? Research and development, uh, research and development for iPads, iP those jobs that are 
uh, research and directly related to the creation of a book or, a, or, or an iPad or an iPhone, etc. Directly. So a company that may be producing, may be de designing for, for um, Apple would be considered directly related. At the transport of the iPods and the app from one place to another one, which with, without which you would not be able to use an iPod. Those things are directly related to manufacturing. To retail trade, uh -huh. uh, retail services. Uh, retail services, that yes, yes, exactly. All these activities are manufacturing related services, which without, you would not be able to benefit from them. And that, that is, and I, we feel that we should always have understood manufacturing like that. We never did in the past. We always understood manufacturing as just making things, mm -hmm. which was never the case. But, uh, but, but we always thought of it like that, partially because in the past, 50 years ago, the research and development facilities would probably be in the factory itself. And, and, and so we measured it as part of the factory. Nowadays, with the fragmentation of production, you have the research and development facilities moving somewhere else, the marketing moving somewhere else, the logistics moving somewhere else, and we have new different sectors emerging. But at that time, when we started statistics 50 years after the war, everything was lumped. So, so we thought of manufacturing as production because that was the biggest chunk of it. The reality was that we also had services then, but we didn't count them. Now we are counting them. And, 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 and I think we have to first make that point clear. That's one of the novelties, by the way. <laughs> Making it, it always existed, but um, we make it clear and we try to measure it. I think that is, and uh, let me at this point address the question of the novelty. We were not aiming at not having anything novel here. That was not the point of this. Report. The point of this was report was to document these kinds of trends. That is a novelty fit, which has not, not been done the way we've, we've done it. Measuring employment, the way to be clear about the measuring employment, distinguishing informal from informal, trying to address this issue of manufacturing related services, because it's crucial in developed countries. This is the novelty of the report, and try to document a bit the, 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 the better than in the past, the figures of structural change and numbers and ratios, all that, which has not been done. We were not aiming at bringing novel ideas here. We were aiming at documenting what we all know, but we have not shown. That was the purpose of this report. Um, coming back to the, uh, to, um, another issue that I wanted to say is, again, we presented the uh, ty typology. We presented the average of averages here. Now, our analysis goes much deeper. We are, we are differentiating. We can do the same analysis differentiated by countries by resource intensity, for example. We can differentiate by population, by population intensity. We have analysis that differentiates all these, all these um, characteristics. Um, we also are examining the deviations over the average to see why countries do better than others. We're doing all this, this is all the research we're doing, but of course I could, we could not, this is a program of the, of, the, of the branch. We are working, I presented two digits here. We're working at four digits. We are, I presented only output, value added, we're including exports and inputs. So the work is much broader, but again, not everything fits into 100 pages. So all these, the different types, etc., and all the, all, all the richness mm -hmm. is, is yet to come. We could not put everything here. Um, well, yeah, the work is not totally finished yet anyway, but that's that's in the direction we're going. So we'll be able to differentiate by types of countries, etc. All, all that is part of the agenda. Okay, um, how, uh, how do, uh, how do countries move upwards in the in the in the in the in the, in the value chain, which is a point you raised. Um, first, the first point, Bangladesh is doing very well. We have, as I said, I have some detailed information about Bangladesh, which is doing far better than average in the garments industry. Now, um, now, how do they move up? Of course, it has to do with skills, and, and has it has to do with skills. It has to do with training. It has to do with has to do sometimes with foreign investment. Foreign investment does not play as much role as one thinks it is. I think the Chinese experience, and I, when I was looking at at, at, at uh, Xiao Lan's figures, if if a foreign invest, invested enterprises was at the bottom in terms of employment generation. I think those figures are for the economy as a whole, not for manufacturing, but that coincides with something that I've seen in, in, in other figures that the Chinese manufacturing growth has not been explained by, by and large by foreign investment, but by TVEs and by SOEs. They have had a major chunk. So um, investment, I think that the point I want to make here is that investment is a critical dimension of, of manufacturing growth, but we are looking too much into FDI and too little into domestic investment. And we should look into domestic investment too. 
Um, so it, it is a tradition of variables. They play different in different countries under different circumstances. And if you want me to go country by country, Bangladesh has, we even, we even met some of the, um, were sitting with us in the table, the daughter of the guy that started the Bangladeshi text, the garment industry 25 years ago. And how they started it in that specific case is for in, in the 60s and 70s. What they did in that case was this guy said, well, we, we, we have a comparative advantage here, but there's no way we're going to start a, 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 a decent manufacturing garments industry if we do not train our people. So they got 150 Bangladeshis, which were sent to Korea. 50% men, 50% women, by the way. Were sent to Korea. They were trained in, in, in the war at the time, okay? And then came back and started the first garment factory at the time. So there was, there was leadership, there was vision, there was training, there were all these elements there. There was entrepreneurship. Yeah, there were all these elements in Bangladesh that started the garments industry 40 years ago. Okay, I'm, 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 I'm glad that we I were there because it was first hand story that I heard. So if you want me to, to answer the how, mm -hmm. the only way I can answer the how is case by case. Okay, so, <laughs> and do we have five years? Then I can, I can go country by country. So, um, so I, I think it's country specific. Yes, <laughs> it's country specific. It's country specific. And I think I mentioned another, another. I, I've been in Namibia in, and, and we were discussing export processing zones. And we know the act that the success of export processing zones in China. And I was in Wallis Bay in Namibia, which is a, a total failure of and I was asked, uh, uh, and I, uh, uh, the Chinese came in, put factories there. Um, they tried to employ local people. After a while, it didn't work. They brought the Chinese in. They fought, they, the Chinese started fighting with the local people, so the Chinese left, and there's nothing there. <laughs> That's, uh, in, this is Namibia. Um, so why was that? And why didn't that s become a successful story? Human resources. The, the problem that the, that, 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 that the, 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 the um, they, they, they could not, that, and that has to do with the skills I was going to raise earlier, that the local, the Chinese investors could not get the human resources, the nature and type of human resources they were looking for. And they had access to prime access to food, go out to the American market, and still nothing happened. So one has to look into, to answer that, how one has to look into very specific conditions to be able to, because any of the variables I mentioned could be one of the drivers or cause or whatever, but, um, but it, 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 it affects in depending on the circumstances, the conditions, etc. Um, market orientation is very important. I think I may, I, may, I, I, I in the agro processing industry, uh, it, that the domestic industry, the domestic market is critically important. It is more important by far than the, than the export market, and it has to do with. If you look at it, it, has to do also with the evolution of cities. We do have a chapter where we link uh, manufacturing growth and and, and urbanization. And as you run, as, as people move to the cities, they need more industry processed food. Okay, so Africa, I will see, I, I, I suspect rapid growing as agro processing due to the domestic market of people moving to the cities. The cities in Africa are large. So, and they transport. I remember when I studied here, the milkman used to bring the milk to, to my every day. I was living in campus at the university, and the milkman used to leave a bottle of milk in my door, third floor in my flat mm -hmm. in Sussex every day. There. That's no longer the case. Now it's in supermarkets. It's um, and some of, some of that milk came from the some from the farm. Sometimes you can get it directly from the farm. Pasteurize the farm and deliver it at your uh, door. That's no longer the case with urbanization. That you need to process it. You need large scale processing and all that. You, you need supermarkets, and that is going to make the the, the agro industry grow and agro processing. And that's exclusively domestic market. Okay, as in. Africa has around 50 million, 50 million people, uh, individuals with consuming power at the moment, on one billion people. Now that is growing at, let's say, three million a year. Very slowly, but growing. And they are urbanizing. That is going to draw, pull that processing, agro-processing industry without the doubt. So, <coughs> final minute. Fin final minute. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the informal and informal. The infor um, uh, we do not have answers to the informal. We do not have answers to the informal. We discovered it ourselves. It was a process of discovery because when we were collecting the data, when we collect, we were trying to collect the data, and we realized that there was a huge, huge gap in in our in our data, that we were uh, it didn't make sense. 150 million, 200 million unemployed manufacturing. No, it's, there's something wrong there. So we explored, explored more, and started crossing our database with the ILO database, crossing databases here and there. 
And then we started realizing that there's a lot more unemployment there. That, and it's two continents where they form an informal uh, 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 growth takes place, where in growth takes place in informal Africa and Latin America. And uh, again, that's the nice thing of, of, of having the job I have because I move around and visit lots of factories everywhere. And I was in Lima in December and, and, and because of the Union's General Conference. And after that, one of the parliamentarians invited me to visit factories. So I went to visit factories, I like visiting factories. And he took me to this area, which is co a complete, this is a, uh, an area of residences, people where people should be living. And then they had some small garage, you open in, and this is, and you see five to eight people with CNC machine tools, very advanced, well, not very advanced because they are a bit old by now, but, but CNC machine tools, cutting metal, making parts and pieces. Now, 20, 30 years ago in Peru, uh, that would not have happened. Now, these are urban areas, residential areas, where you have a gar garage, a garage, garage, and I think that, to me, explains a lot of what's going happening in terms of, and I suspect Africa is the same. Um, this is a sort of personal history. Uh, I, I, I've seen these processes of urbanization and, and industrialization taking place in Latin America beginning in the 70s. And now you see similar phenomena taking place in Africa 20 years later, moving the people from rural areas to, 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 to the urban, these small garage things emerging. In, in Latin America, they're a bit more advanced. They're much more advanced technologically. But the processes are very similar. People moving, entrepreneurship, small. Uh, and and, and that, I think that, that those kinds of phenomena are taking place in Africa. That's why informalization, informal employment is taking place. Um, there is the experience of the 70s and 80s, and probably the same experience in Africa, but nobody wants to go formal. Nobody wants to establish big factories. They're still afraid of moving there, entrepreneurs, I mean. But if they can keep informal, they can keep uh, hidden, they can keep entrepreneurship and activity grows. Very good. Okay. Mm. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you very much, um, for Ludo. So that, that uh, brings us to the uh, end of the meeting. It's 2.30 now. 2.40. Uh, 2.40. <laughs> um, uh, lots of uh, interesting numbers in the report. And mm -hmm. uh, it's 250 pages, but you promised us that there's there's much more. Behind <laughs> it. So there must be at least three other volumes. So <laughs> kind of a thousand pages of, uh, of, uh, of important Unigo information. Uh, uh, I hope we can all access that on the, on the website. And it's, uh, it's very illuminating. Um, we also had some very interesting remarks from our discussions uh, on, uh, on differentiation, on uh, links between uh, manufacturing and uh, services, and also some suggestions for the, for the next uh, industrial development report. So Shaolan already mentioned about sort of the uh, importance of technology, that's very important. Uh, uh, Maggie mentioned uh, the importance of informality and, and that you already uh, moved a bit in that area. So there are uh, some interesting suggestions for, uh, for, the, for the next report. And, uh, we hope to uh, to be with you uh, on, on, on that as well, and uh, and then in two years' time launch launch, uh, launch that report. <laughs> so uh, thank you. Uh, the discussion. Apologies for the for the slight problems at the beginning, but I think uh, you made up for it uh, towards the end. That's thank you very much for that, um, and thank you for uh, for Ludo for uh, for launching the report and. Uh, uh, all the best and also success uh, t uh, tomorrow, is it? And uh, the launch Monday, in, uh, in, uh, in New York, isn't it? Uh, mm -hmm. Of the report. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>